wonderful folks over at Wolf and Company for asking me to come and and uh, talk to all of you today. I now have the pressure of a uh, pretty big segue on my shoulders because the uh, previous group um, actually did discuss quite a few things I will address in today's presentation, but from a kind of a different lens. Um, the previous panel, um, you know, are obviously uh, related to fintechs. Um, you have a lot of market entrants coming in um, to the industry. And we know there is a tremendous amount of pent up demand uh, amongst the community banks and credit unions on doing business with these suppliers. So today I'm going to talk about some of the barriers uh, to entry and to exit for community financial institutions when they go about implementing their innovation strategy or their fintech strategy. Now, fintech is uh, just as new to me as it is to anyone else in this industry uh, because it is a relatively um, new thing that's going on. And we'll talk about that a little bit. That's why the previous panel discussed risks and making deals to make deals with these suppliers. But um, my background, as uh, she was just explaining, uh, for the last 14 years, all we've done is negotiated these agreements uh, with the legacy cores, with a lot of fintech suppliers, um, a lot of deals with fintechs and cores, all the neo cores, the digital core, the digital neo, I mean, the, the, all, that, all the stuff that's out there, uh, we deal with this on a, on a daily basis. And we see all the different ways that uh, the market is consuming technology and what community banks are looking for in their agreements. And we take that information and, and bring it to bear. Um, as she was introdu introducing me, which is very nice, there was a couple things in the introduction that weren't quite right. Uh, one is that we've returned over a half a billion dollars of uh, cost reduction to community banks um, across the United States from institutions ranging as small as maybe 150 million up to 30 and $35 billion. And we do this using something we call the Paladin Blue Book. I think Stephanie called it the Blue Rock or something like that. But anyway, that's a cool name. I'm gonna take that for another offering, but it's the Blue Book. And so when we negotiate these agreements, we're doing it from a place of knowledge. We're not just guessing um, many, I mean, all banks uh, would not have access to this information. And so when you negotiate against these suppliers and also the fintech suppliers that are coming uh, up into the industry, you're effectively guessing. So we've pledged to ourselves and to the industry, we'll never guess, we'll only do it from data. And so we have this blue book, which has thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, uh, contracts and tens of thousands of invoices and hundreds of thousands of line items, detail and pricing. So we can use that information to triangulate and help our uh, clients get the best possible market deal. Uh, we get involved in a lot of M&A and um, to date we've probably closer to about $200 million in equity we've helped uh, preserve uh, in these transactions that are happening uh, between banks all across the U.S. Another hat that I wear is a CEO of something called a Golden Contract Coalition, which will come up quite a bit in today's presentation. I think it's of particular interest to fintechs that are attempting to enter this market and they, you know, a, a fintech, generally a VC-backed company or PE-backed company, or maybe an angel-backed company coming through an incubator, maybe out of an incubator or an accelerator and wanting to penetrate the market. And uh, the best way to penetrate the market is lowering your risk profile to community bankers who are still learning, as the panel uh, expressed, on how to partner with fintechs. And so what the coalition does, uh, one of the things that it does is it helps fintechs change their agreements in such a way that they can share with a banker that if you do business with me, you can just focus on my solution. You don't have to worry about my contract because it meets or exceeds these golden contract standards. So it changes the risk profile in the way a banker sees a fintech company and they're more willing to adopt their services. And this, so this is great for the industry because it compresses timeframes for the FinTech uh, folks to enter the market. And it increases their competitiveness against the legacy suppliers that they're generally competing against. And it's a win-win for everybody. So we'll talk about a little bit that, a little bit about that more later. 
So everyone is talking fintech. It's it's um, it reminds me of the early two thousands when online banking uh, was appearing, and everyone was talking about online banking. But back then, you had a group of I'd say a third of the market that was ready to jump on board and saw it as the future. You had a third of the market um, that were ready to follow, but not as, but they wanted to see it uh, get done first. And then you had a third that thought it was a fad. Um, with FinTech, there's nobody that thinks it's a fad. Uh, I think you either have movers or people that are about to move in FinTech. The market landscape has shaped itself such that community banks and credit unions just don't have a choice. They must move into FinTech relationships because the legacy suppliers that we've depended on for so long uh, legacy suppliers we depend on so long are not innovating. And we'll get into that in just a second. Um, there are a lot of barriers that uh, banks have to think about when um, moving into FinTech, they have to move away from their legacy suppliers. And the legacy suppliers have manufactured um, many barriers to exit. But what the legacy suppliers have also done is they very, very um, slyly might even say in a conniving way, uh, they've created um, ways to work against the community banking industry in adopting fintech. At the same time, they're saying that they're really interested in you doing anything you want to do in technology. They're actually talking out of both sides of their mouth. And as um, he introduced me a minute ago, I don't have a bias toward um, any, any vendor out there. I just have a bias toward the truth. And I'm gonna spend some time today talking uh, to you about exactly what is going on in the market and how these suppliers are actually, um, you know, I guess getting their cake and eating it too. <clears throat> now, when you look at contact or FinTech in the context of uh, how you can implement it, you gotta figure out how to do it. So at the end of the presentation, we have something called our two-pronged FinTech attack. And it's a kind of a simple way of thinking about making your early moves in fintech, how to adopt fintech while at the same time uh, relieving the stress and control that the legacy suppliers have over um, your institution. Now, fintech, I think, is a, it's a big term. It uh, is not used lightly. It, it, uh, des it describes many different entities, but for purposes of today's uh, discussion, I wanna think of fintech in really three ways. One is there's disruptive fintech, and these are the folks that are obviously competing against the bank. Uh, PayPal's, Venmo's, um, you know, Amazon, whoever it may be that is a non-bank that's potentially taking services away from or services away from the community banking industry, or they're providing services that make the uh, your customers use you less because maybe you don't have that capability. So those are the competitors. Collaborative or friendly fintech, which is where we're going to spend most of the time talking about today, and that's what everyone's interested in is doing business with a friendly fintech. These are the ones that are enhancing and improving uh, the options and the services that you provide to your your customers, your end users. And then we have legacy. I don't even like to use the word fintech when I talk legacy, but generally, uh, Pfizer, FIS, Jack Henry, these are not fintech companies. These are legacy uh, companies and they use FinTech in their marketing, but you and I all know, know well enough, these are not FinTech companies. To me, to be a FinTech company, you had to have been invented after 2015. Now I know there's gonna be exceptions um, to that, but I think generally the architectures and the systems, the technology to make possible the architecture, like the cloud-based architectures and things like that we have today, really weren't in vogue until around after 2015. So that's why I picked that date. And I'm sure there's people that would um, dispute that with me and I probably wouldn't fight too hard depending on the situation, but right around 2015, obviously our legacy companies were invented back in the eighties. There's technologies from the eighties and their contracts are from maybe the nineties. Uh, a FinTech is going to um, target innovations around services that are already considered by large banks. And our industry is faced with the fact that we have these large institutions, Wells, Capital One, Ally, and it goes on and on. They are providing these amazing services 
that our community financial industry uh, needs in order to compete with them. So the fintechs that I'm interested in, the friendly fintechs, are targeting providing those services to community banks. Most of these companies are VC or PE backed. And as I mentioned a minute ago, they have a very modern architecture cloud native API. Okay. So that's uh, what a fintech is to me. Now, the, the market situation really is, I think all of us understand that when it looks at, when you look at the, um, the performance of the different size banks across the country, community banks are lagging far behind. And we know that a big contributor of this today is in fact the technology that the big guys are offering. Um, here's a, an example of just some of the services that fintechs are providing to these larger uh, top 10 institutions. And that's really what the community banking industry is looking to do. We're looking to be able to um, you know, add these services ourselves just in the same, same way the big guys have done. Now, there are a lot of community banks and a couple of these brands I'm looking at here have actually been merged away like Radius Bank, but there are a lot of banks out there that are really leading the charge in doing business with fintechs and really an adopting a fintech banking style or fintech uh, culture. They don't have to be a 100% fintech bank to be uh, relative or re to be relatable, but there are a lot of banks out there that are doing a lot of things and really cutting new roads that should inform the rest of us that it is becoming safer and safer every day to do business with fintechs. Now, the, the market issue uh, we have really is that uh, as we sit today, you know, we have these large institutions that um, handle a tremendous amount of the business. We have this, um, this market oligopoly that we're in the middle of. Everything you do with these folks takes a long time to implement. Their fees are just outrageous. And we know, and I know for all the years we've been in business, these agreements are completely one-sided and not favorable to the banking franchise at all. It really is remarkable after 14 years that these, um, these companies have not changed their stripes. And in fact, unfortunately, we are seeing some fintechs coming to market with similar uh, contract provisions and, and overall contract behaviors. And um, you know, the industry is looking for uh, fintech options but these folks, these legacy cores make it very, very difficult uh, to integrate. At the last session, I think the last question, someone was very polite in talking about, well, it, maybe it's not as easy and there's shortcuts and things like that. That's not the way it should be. Uh, you know, a bank should be able to do business with any FinTech it wants and uh, their core partner should be doing, willing to do anything it needs to do to help you to do that. And that's, we go through here, I'll show you that that's not going on. <clears throat> Whenever you negotiate against uh, somebody, you have to know who it is and you have to understand um, what their position is. And so this chart I like to show uh, is really, it's a, it's a market chart of the, uh, the Dow, NASDAQ and the S&P 500. And in the red, blue and black lines on top, these are this, this is the stock performance of these three legacy cores that control 93% of the market over time. As you can see, they're excellent uh, investments. I actually have invested uh, in Pfizer, FIS, and Jack Henry since as far back as I can remember. And um, uh, they have been, they're excellent from a shareholder's perspective, but they're really not what they should be relative to doing business with them. Around 2012, they had marshaled about 68% of the market, 74% by 2014. 85% by 2016. And um, when you get to that much market control, you create what's called an anti-competitive bargaining position, an anti-competitive bargaining position. Some folks uh, might use the term uh, monopoly or antitrust, but our antitrust laws are really only focused on the impact to consumers, not the impact to commercial entities like community banks. So if community banks were people um, and these companies delivered services to those individuals, they absolutely would be in a monopolistic position, the fact that three of them possess so much power. Well, back in uh, 2016, 
uh, since the banking associations really weren't doing anything at the time to try to combat the influence these folks had over the market, we launched something called Golden Contract Coalition, which is a separate entity. And the idea is to create a standard, a golden contract standard that all suppliers will adopt uh, its structure at least so that when a community bank does business with them, they can say, I've got the golden contract standard and the bank is going to be more interested in working with them as opposed to working with the old way of doing business where they have these sort of predatory terms and conditions. So we launched that in 2016. The market um, uh, domination continued. By 2020, these three suppliers controlled 93% of the market. And I think it's about 93 to 94% of the market uh, now. Um, we launched the Golden Contract Coalition. We launched uh, later this year or at the end of this year, something called GC Certified. And this is what I was mentioning at the beginning, something we can talk about you know, another time, but it is a, it is a uh, capability for new FinTech suppliers that are entering the market to adopt agreements that we already know based on all of our years of experience that banks are looking for. It doesn't mean that the FinTech has to change the way they do business or, or not be profitable or, or not have a, an agreement that's favorable to them and their shareholders. But rather than going out there, you know, banging your head against the wall for years, trying to figure out why, what the ideal contract is you should have, certifying the agreement in a proactive way, we think is a great way, a healthy way for fintechs to enter the market with as lowest friction as possible. Because at the end of the day, if we do have a bias, the bias is we want to see fintechs uh, do fantastic and put market pressure on the large legacy cores to change the way that they conduct business. If that's were to happen, every, it would be great for everybody. Now. While Fiserv, FIS, and Jack Henry have organized um, this anti-competitive bargaining position, there is something else going on that we saw happen within the, over the last couple of years, but I don't think everyone quite understands what is happening. So Fiserv acquired First Data, which had previously acquired Elon. It was the largest acquisition of a payments company in US history. Shortly thereafter, FIS acquired WorldPay. Previous to that, Vantive had bought WorldPay, but they kept the WorldPay name. And then as I said, FIS came and bought them. The second largest uh, transaction in US history for a payments company. Jack Henry, as of yet, has not made a move. We thought that they would acquire TSIS. Um, they did not. But I would predict that in the future, there's gonna be movement here. Now, why did Fiserv and FIS buy these payments, of company, payments companies and effectively become payments companies? Uh, I think there's two answers. The first answer is payments is where everything is going. I would say on a weighted average, probably a third of the fintechs that are appearing on the marketplace today, the friendly fintechs, have something to do with payments layaway payments, microloan payments, person-to-person -person payments, splitting of payments, foreign transaction payments, 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 payments. And these guys know it. Uh, and that's where all the action is. But what they've also done is they've furthered their um, oligopoly. And the way they've done it is yesterday, pre-merger, these three companies control a huge part of the non-interest expense on any bank's uh, P&L statement in the country today. Only payroll is larger than the cost that you spend with these companies. By making these acquisitions of these payments companies, now they are going to be able to start controlling non-interest income because obviously the payments revenue is non-interest income. So now you're going to be negotiating with vendors that control a huge part of your non-interest expense and have your non-interest income. So they've started to organize their oligopoly vertically. And this is something very, very important for people to understand and not lose sight of because that is what's going on. And I think it's, um, as a shareholder of these companies, again, I think it's absolutely brilliant. They've done that, but I don't think it's very positive for the industry. I get a chance every year uh, to do a lot of consulting, FinTech consulting with some of the 
uh, you know, biggest market uh, com market uh, making companies in the country, or market um, analysts in the in the country, and um, Evercore, Cantor Fitzgerald, Citadel, UBS, and others. And uh, I asked them to help me understand just how these companies are spending on innovation, because again. As bankers, the industry has to awaken to the fact that your partner is not innovating. And they say they're innovating and they say they're spending lots of money in that, in that uh, segment of their business. But I want to show to you that it's actually not true. Here is analysis provided by these three companies to me independently. And it shows that the free cash flow which is the amount of uh, income that they're putting back into the company is ranging with FIS as high as 9%, 6.5% from Fiserv and under 4% for Jack Henry. Now, to give you context, according to these analysts and these, and these FinTech experts at these, these companies, I've asked them, what would a company be spending if it was really actually innovating? And they said somewhere between 18 and 22% of free cash flow should be going back into the business. That is clearly not happening here. And the fact that these companies and the industry is still um, burdened with these old, old tech um, capabilities, these services, we know that a lot of that money is going toward keeping old stuff running. This uh, should be obvious to everyone. And it's really something that's driving the market trend for uh, fintech to be successful. Now, I throw this up here just to show that Fiserv isn't spending all their money on technology. They did have time to um, uh, put their name on the uh, Milwaukee Bucks stadium. So that's our, that's our joke pause for a minute here. All right, so now we understand these companies are not innovating. We understand that um, FinTech has to be an option that we have to do it. But I wanna address for a minute, the ways in which, uh, and the areas in which we could be innovating that are being purposely affected uh, by your, you know, your core partner and what to do about it. So what this model is supposed to show at the top here is, here's some example of a cross section of the banks that we're competing with and here are the areas where fintech is rearing its head and being very, um, you know, where I think the greatest opportunities lie, online banking, blockchain, loan, LOS, online account opening, AI, et cetera. Some of the previous panels talked a lot about that. And here are the, you know, the big five, the five leading providers um, down here, not doing much of this on their own because of the previous slide I showed you, they're just not doing it. And this has created this, what I call an innovation chasm. And thankfully, we'll, we live in the United States in a capitalist environment where, where friction is lowest, that's where capital flows. And so that's why we have so many VC backed, um, you know, finance, uh, FinTech companies out there right now, because all this capital, billions and billions and billions of dollars are flowing in this area to address this, this market gap, which is great. And that brings us to, to where we are right now. I think the number one question uh, bankers ask us about FinTech is when is there going to be a FinTech core that can replace my Pfizer, FIS, Jack Henry, you know, legacy core Finastra relationship? And there's a lot of hope out there. So I, I created this slide here to talk about, if you see, that's a cloud-based core. It says cloud with the word core on it up there. Uh, I don't think it's going to be a while before the Messiah gets here. And let me tell you, I think there's three reasons why the um, FinTech core is not going to be available to, to the majority of the market. The first is there's just a tremendous amount of pent-up demand. If you think about it, and you could secretly poll every banker in the United States, and you ask them, if you could leave Fiserv for a modern cloud-based core, would you do it? Or FIS or Jack Henry? The number of hands, I'm sure 
you know, more than 80% of the market would love to get off that antiquated piece of software and get onto something FinTech. So if that were the case, the pent up demand is so great, even if all the neo cores that are out there right now and the ones that are contemplated to come to market in the next few years, there's no way they can handle all that pent up demand. You would be in a very, very long line waiting for your chance to, to uh, convert to that new FinTech core. So that's the first issue. The second issue is there's a complete absence of takeaway capital. Right now, the way that Fiserv or FIS or Jack Henry take business from each other is with takeaway capital. They're able to discount their services so far or so much or offer incentives, financial incentives, enough that it will offset the termination expense and the conversion expense for that bank to leave the incumbent vendor to come over. And these can be in the millions of dollars of conversion cost. That's the only way they are able to eat each other's lunches all the time is takeaway capital. FinTech companies don't have takeaway capital or they have very little. They don't have massive coffers of cash or the ability to reduce their fees such that they can make up the difference and still perform for their shareholders. It just doesn't exist right now. So this is gonna slow things up. These uh, fintech uh, suppliers, especially the ones that are trying to rip and replace the existing core, tremendous, tremendous barriers to entry because of this issue right here. And the third one is, I think and it's more emotional, is the risk of change. Those same bankers uh, that would love to live, leave their legacy core and raise their hand to do that and would get in line to do that. If you ask them which ones are actually willing to do it, and you know, who wants to be the 10th core, 10th bank on a new core, or the 15th, or the 20th? You know, uh, bankers are risk managers, and this is a this would be a hard one for them to do. So I think when you combine these three issues, one emotional and two, uh, one hypothetical and one factual, I think it's gonna be at least three to five more years before there are enough neo cores available for you to actually switch, which means you're going to be saddled with your relationship with a legacy core for some time. Now, what I wanted to do, uh, Wolf asked me to, um, to share here with everybody. There's a lot of names that are out on the market today of neo cores or cloud-based cores that are coming or that are here. And I wanted to put them in front of you in a way that we think about them. And so I'm using this magic quadrant concept um, made popular by Accenture, I believe. Down here in the bottom left, if the logo appears here, this is a vendor that's in market and has proven their capabilities. So the risk profile is gonna be palatable to most banks. Over here is a vendor that is pre-market um, and not necessarily proven in the United States. That's what the asterisk here. There are a few companies that are proven in South America, in Europe, but they're not proven here in our market, which is distinctly different. Here are uh, vendors in this upper right that are pre-market and unproven, so really early stage companies. And then here are companies that have moved into the market, but they don't have enough customers yet where you can have a high confidence and a low to have a low enough risk profile to want to replace your core. So when you look here in the bottom right of companies that are pre-market but are proven elsewhere, uh, you've got a few uh, right here. And FinZact um, is one that comes up a lot and I think still can be probably a, a market favorite. Their architecture, their concept, what they're trying to do I think is brilliant, but they are, they're unproven. They only have a few installations. I think one installation, the community bank, and then they have some installations elsewhere um, in the back office of larger institutions. So they're not really market ready yet to be adopted, although we all wish they were here um, today. Um, there's a core that's been around for a while called Nimbus. I think it was the first cloud-based core. I think they've been around five or six years now. And they have sort of reinvented themselves uh, because they learned earlier than anyone, that the business proposition of going in and 
asking a bank to rip out their core and then replace it with um, their service, which had been unproven because they were down in this, um, they were up in this upper right quadrant for a while. That wasn't gonna work. And so now they've got a digital bank and some other capabilities, uh, some professional services around marketing and customer support that they package along with their digital bank and that actually is doing quite well. But we don't have anyone down here yet that's in market and proven. Now I know there's people on the call that are thinking there's, there's brands that are not here and I'm sure there are, and I'd like you to tell me who they are. I know th probably who they are. I just didn't wanna put them all on here and you know go down the rabbit hole talking about all of them. I just wanna highlight a few. Now there's a couple, uh, Neocova and Galileo, Neocova in particular, they appeared about a year or so ago, had a lot of promise, um, but they realized what Nimbus realized and they decided to profile a different offering um, for the time being a data warehouse product, which is very strong and get some brand awareness and build some confidence in the marketplace around their Neocova brand and their Neocova services so that they could reintroduce their core at a later date. I call this a confidence building cycle. And, um, you know, many startups do that. So that's where I think we're on the Neo core, three to five years before there's a real core. Now, when you're talking about online banking and mobile, the picture is much more different, much different than the course. Um, you got um, companies like uh, Aperture Open, which is formerly Funds Express, which is absolutely you know in market, moving into being proven. Narmi, Allegent. We've got a lot of folks like Alchemy, Q2, DI, Aperture Express that are down here in this in market and proven category, and there are others as well. Um, so this is a the fintechs in this space, in this segment of the core stack started many, you know, plenty of years ago. I think Q2 started in 2012. I mean, they have a soccer stadium here in Austin where I live named after them. Uh, so a lot of options here. And again, I know there's a lot more brands of online uh, banking and mobile providers out there, but I just wanted to highlight a few. This is how a banker should think. What quadrant are these providers? The, the more, the further they're out, Toward this upper quadrant, the risk profile increases. You have to be very certain about doing business with them, and you have to make sure that you write a contract that addresses the fact that they're out here or up here. Um, in this quadrant is a different issue. Online account opening, another area that's very popular, uh, got extremely popular during the pandemic and continues to be, I think, a service that every bank has to do. Um, Again, a lot of good brands here. More brands are in the in-market and proven area. Lots of good options. Um, you know, we could go on and on about different segments, but generally, this is all great and healthy for the community banking market. Okay, but if you keep in mind um, that there's not going to be a lot of options for at least another three to five years, that should inform your thinking on how you're. Um, writing your innovation plans in your bank. Now, for the next couple of slides, I'm going to talk about um, why the legacy cores are not innovating um, because they should. It's my belief that at some point they had a, an inflection moment and they realized that culturally they're not able to innovate. Um, and that's why they're not, one of the reasons why they're not spending on innovation. I mean, these are old companies. Um, the management teams running these organizations are, you know, part of the old guard. Yeah, there's a lot of, I know I hate to make a brush, broad brushstroke like that, but there are a lot of very smart, intelligent people there. And, but, you know, they have a legacy and this is the way it's always been. So they saw the FinTech opportunity coming and they decided that they weren't going to invent something because any one of them on their own could invent a cloud-based core, any one of them. I mean, ask them sometimes why they have not done it. There's two reasons. One, culturally, they're not a, they're not a startup. They're not, they don't have the cultural values of a startup and are willing to you know, invent these types of things when they don't have to. Um, and the second is if any one of them invented a brand new cloud-based API core, it would be a mutiny. 
every one of everyone on their platforms would want to leave and they would have a major success failure. So I think that's why they haven't done it. But the biggest reason they haven't done it because they don't have to. They can make money off of the fintech revolution simply by monetizing it. And one of the ways they monetize it is through their contracts. Inside their agreements, they make it very, very difficult to leave and go on to another service. So they have prepared and man they have manufactured and prepared language inside of everyone's agreements on these calls that even though their marketing says they want you to do business with whoever you want, there's gonna be a price to pay if you wanna do that. The, the second way um, they innovate it is through the technology. So this is an example. This graphic here was actually provided to me by Fiserv because they saw me do this presentation somewhere else and they didn't like the graphic I had, so they gave me one. The second way they're monetizing uh, the market is through the API, the application protocol interface. Every FinTech just about needs to talk to an API. The word integration did not exist when these, when Fiserv rolled out their platforms or FIS or Jack Henry. It didn't exist. To be fair to them, it just did not exist. But on purpose, they are not publishing all of their APIs. There could be thousands and thousands of APIs, not to get too technical, there could be thousands and thousands of APIs that any one of these cores could publish, but they have decided to only publish a very small segment of what they think the most common APIs are. And if you want to um, have access to different APIs, you're going to have to pay to do that. Um, and in the case of Fiserv, and the same with FIS and Jack Henry, they have created a choke point called Communicator Advantage. Um, with uh, Jack Henry, I think it's JE, J Exchange, and I can't remember what FIS calls theirs, but they've created this choke point, which they say is an open API. They are not open. None of their APIs are open. They're kind of open-ish. Because uh, if you can't program to their API, I mean, an open API is an API that can be issued to the general programming public with a software development kit, an SDK, and you can get anyone off the street to program to their API. That is not the case with their APIs. They have purposely minimized their APIs. They've crippled down the APIs that they do issue. And they're monetizing it by making the fintechs that want to write to their API and code to their API pay for it. And then they want the banks to then pay to get access to their API. And then every time the bank accesses their data, they have to pay again. A brilliant, brilliant uh, model in monetizing API. They have no incentive whatsoever to make it easy. And they are not making it easy. And a lot of the fintechs that do business with them you know, they can't go out publicly and complain about it because they're their partner. And I understand that they'd be respectful to them. But at the end of the day, these guys are holding the keys. So I wanted to show an example of how they're doing this in a more practical way. Let's say on the right, this, this uh, refers to a lot of the, um, just a, a, any, any number of fintechs, whoever it might be. And they, and you go to uh, Jack Henry and you say, hey, Jack Henry, I want to do business with this fintech um, I'm going to turn off a service that we have with you because it's not competitive. I don't like it. It looks like it's from 1990. Uh, and I want to do business. I want to bring this fintech in. I want them to access my data. Jack Henry says, ooh, that sucks. But um, we hate to lose your business. But let's talk about your exclusivity clause. And your exclusivity clause says, and everyone's got one, you can do business with anyone else but Jack Henry for any similar service or any like-like service. So since you're having to, you're going to leave Jack Henry a, a piece of their service, not their core. Let's say you're leaving NetTeller, their online banking product. You're going to violate their exclusivity clause. And when you violate their exclusivity clause, the only way to get around it is to compensate them by paying a termination expense. Everyone knows about termination expense. In this case with Jack Henry, they charge 100% termination. So they're not innovating. They're spending less than 4% of their free cash flow in their products and services, which means their products are horrible. Not all their products are horrible, but their net tellers are not good. And because it's not good, you can't compete. 
So then you go and you want to leave that service because you have your bank's interest in mind to compete with the big guys. And then you have to pay them 100% to leave the service that they want to innovate in. It's absolutely brilliant. But this is how they are monetizing the industry. Then you have to pay them a deconversion expense because the way that those programs are written and the way the data is managed is, again, from the 1990s at some point, early 1990s, they have to put it in, a, they have to normalize the data so your fintech can access it. Then your data, then your, your fintech has to convert the data, you have to pay them too. And then here's the big one. Now you have to go back to Jack Henry and say, please, may I have access to my data on your system? So the fintech provider I just hired because I had to leave your product because it wasn't competitive and you weren't implement, you weren't invested enough in it. Can I please have access to my data? And they say, oh, no problem. We've got this wonderful thing called J Exchange. It's open APIs. Come on in. Cha-ching, cha-ching. Uh, they can, this can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then on top of that, you have to um, pay every time you access your data. If you can get through all those barriers to exit, or entry, however you want to look at them, <laughs> you have to be ready to disrupt your customers. And this, these are the walls that these suppliers have manufactured and put in their agreements and in their technology um, to make it really hard for the industry to adopt FinTech, even though they say they want to make it really easy. Um, I understand all the motivations and you do too, but this is the reality. And this is what you have to think about when you're looking at agreements and when you're looking at agreements with FinTech suppliers. Because uh, FinTech suppliers, I think someone on the previous call said that our previous uh, session, they said that they're, it wasn't, it wasn't her words, but what she meant was they're willing to make deals to make deals. You know, these are very smart uh, companies run by very smart people backed by you know, financially by very smart people in almost all cases. And they want to get market penetration and uh, they're willing to make deals to make deals. You, that, that works to your advantage in a negotiation, um, but it also can work against you if you don't know how to handle a company like that, which is totally different than what we've been dealing with for decades, which is, you know, here's your two inch contract, sign it. Don't look what's inside. I can assure you everyone else signs the same thing and, you know, you as a banker, you go ahead and sign it. So we have to make a plan to leave uh, the legacy cores over time and be ready when the Messiah, the neo cores are finally here and mature enough in three to five years, think more toward five. Um, and we have this thing we call it a two-pronged FinTech attack, which are the moves we think every bank should be making in one form or another to move toward that capability. So you have the maximum amount of leverage and you can be nimble and you can do the things that you need to do for your franchise and not for the vendors. Two, two, uh, two prongs, de-handcuff from your legacy core and prepare for FinTech adoption in the meantime. How do we do this? The first thing we do is we address our contracts. Um, as I've showed you and talked to you and you already know this, um, we have to soften your contracts with your legacy core and restructure them so that you have the rights and the remedies to do what you need to do to build your franchise and to protect your, your interests. And that comes from restructuring of those agreements. Whenever you restructure those agreements, if you do them correctly and you don't do them alone, you do them with, you get some help from somebody that knows that does it for a living, like us, but someone else. You, there's always going to be a cost saving, always going to be a cost reduction. Very rarely does it not happen. You get your legacy core to finance your fintech budget. Uh, you repurpose those dollars toward your early fintech initiatives. I think top of mind on an early fintech initiative in the interest of at some time in the future, uh, de-handcuffing from your legacy core is creating an, an abstraction layer or a data warehouse to get your data onto systems that you own, that you control um, in your data centers or you know, co-located so that as you do the FinTech adoption, you're not having, no one's charging you for access to your data. It's your data, you're accessing it, you control it. 
That's what you should do. Um, the cost of implementing this strategy is coming way, way down over time. And it is absolutely affordable uh, to just about any bank that wants to think about it. But the cost of not doing something sounds so cl cliche. The cost of not doing, not moving in this direction is more than the cost of staying where you're at. Uh, we highly recommend you develop a three-year roadmap to where relative to online banking customers or digital facing customers, 80% of your customers are moved onto those platforms uh, in at least three years, because that's really where the most disruption occurs. It's on your online banking customers. And then simultaneously, you're going to prepare for FinTech adoption by first educating your team and your board of directors, which some of you are doing right now, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, you need to ass assess your technology stack. And you know, where are, what does your technology stack look like? I'm not talking about how many servers do I have or you know, how they're stacked up in a rack. I'm talking about what are the services, account processing, internet banking, bill payment, mobile, LOS, customer service, IVRs. What, what, is, what is my technology stack? And you start to identify areas where you can implement simple FinTech solutions that aren't terribly disruptive, but that are really innovative. Some of the companies uh, that were, some of the folks on the previous call were talking about some of these companies, you know, chatbots, um, which is a, a, a form of artificial intelligence, RPAs, robot process automation, um, you know, everyone's implementing online account opening, LOS, really simple uh, systems uh, to implement, easy to implement, not terribly disruptive, but you start, you find in your stack where the weakness, where the opportunities are, and you begin to address it with FinTech. And then of course, you're gonna have FinTech that's gonna be disruptive to your legacy core. And that's where, if you've done a good job of restructuring your contract and softening these, these terms like exclusivity clause and these termination provisions and things like that, you have, you have a way out that's financially viable. We really see it, it should be a three to year, uh, three to year FinTech innovation plan, because again, um, we, our advice to all of our banks is in five years, uh, you want the, you want your system set up in such a way that you're, you're no longer dependent on your core at the center of your relationship. They're an ancillary part of your relationship. They're just a system of record, the GL. I mean, all of these companies, these legacy cores do a great job of being a core. Let's, I mean, they do a great job of being a core. There's nothing bad to be said about them there. Let, let them be the core if you want, or if you do it right in five years, you take them out behind the barn and get rid of them and you move on to one of the new legacy, one of the new neo cores that I predict are gonna be available to the greater marketplace. If you're FinTech, you know, if you're looking at FinTechs, we highly recommend that you only do business with FinTechs that have their contracts GC certified. Why start a relationship with a FinTech that has all of these predatory terms in their agreement like the legacy guys have done? We, we study the market and I can assure you what's going on right now is these new FinTech companies that are entering the space, they've never rent, written a processing agreement before or a technology agreement before. And where do they get their template? They go out and look at what Pfizer, FIS, and Jack Henry have done, and they take their template and they copy and paste most of it, give it to their attorneys. They manipulate a little bit, but those, 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 those kind of, um, those really offensive things are still, are starting to show up in some of the FinTech contracts. So don't uh, believe that necessarily because they're new FinTech and they, they're, that they're gonna do business in the way you want them to, you have to be prepared to make sure you get what you want. And if, they, if these FinTechs are GC certified, you know they full, follow that golden contract standard and their risk profile is gonna be what you're willing uh, to pallet is effectively it. All right. Oh. Um, for banks that are you know, on the call that are thinking about understanding if they can restructure their core or their core contract and their existing agreements, I would love for you to reach out to us. Um, what we've done in the market for all these years, we want to educate the market on what you have right now. And we do that as a courtesy. We don't charge a penny, no cost, no obligation. We meet with a bank. We look at your contract, your contracts, your invoices. 
We tell you where all the defects are. We tell you what the cost reduction opportunity is, how much money you can generate for your FinTech budget. We identify all these gotchas that are in your, in your agreement that are gonna make it hard for you to de-handcuff. And we provide you a strategy with how to do that. If after doing that, you wanna conduct business with us, that's fine. But this is the way we've always done it. And um, you know we've got many, many, many hundreds of customers out there that would tell you that's exactly how we do it. We always do research before consulting effectively. Uh, we want you to spend time assessing your situation understanding what your first move should be and making the right moves, even if it's with a very small FinTech company. You are in the power seat when it comes to negotiating against FinTech companies. And you are actually in more of a power seat when your legacy cores than um, you, know, you would otherwise believe, even if you are a small bank. If I, I'll leave you with a few things here. Never trust, uh, never not let your trust for your vendor get in the way of your fiduciary responsibilities. Um, the people that operate in these companies are wonderful people. You know, we know many, 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 many of them. A lot of people that work for me are from there. They're great people. Uh, but don't let the, the relationship you've had over so many years get in the way. And don't be intimidated by the fact that they mean so much to you that if you do anything to upset, upset them, somehow you'll be retaliated against. You really should go in very objective um, and negotiate in your only in your interest. You want to spend a lot of time understanding what are the what are the risk factors now and in the future that are going to affect my ability to move and adopt to fintech. Um, we call this obligation risk. There is a tremendous amount of obligation risk in these agreements that prevent you from doing business with fintechs, and that's what we've been talking about. Uh, most of today's presentation. What are those obligations? What are the impact? What have I got to do to go around them and plan to do it? That's really, that's really you know, the key there. Uh, and then the, the third thing, and it's really about understanding your technology stack. Start the de-handcuffing process by understanding where you're at today. It doesn't take a, a, you know, a, you know, you don't have to bring someone in necessarily to do a big assessment, and technical assessment, and all this sort of stuff. It's usually not that hard to get your head around. But understand that when your technology stack is so you can begin to make an approach to get going. So that's the end of my presentation. I hope uh, everything I said came across uh, clear. And um, I guess, I'm, you know, if you have questions, I'd love to answer questions. I was happy to answer them during the presentation, but please let me know um, if there are any questions.